Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing, holy, 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 open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Amen. Welcome, everybody. Those that are uh, coming a little late, um, glad to have our visitors, and welcome everybody that's that's here. Uh, welcome those that are viewing online. Uh, we're glad you're joining us this morning. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare, you're our living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. 
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I hope, hope everybody else is. We're going to be uh, in for a treat. Brother Scott Sullivan will be delivering the message this morning. Our pastor was out this past week on a retreat. Um, I think he had a, a good time, a blessed time, and good fellowship with other uh, people in the work. Um, it's also my dad's birthday. Happy birthday. I forgot to tell you. <laughs> I was going to text him this morning, and then I said, well, I'll just uh, see him at church. And Taylor, happy birthday. We got two. Actually, we got three of Rochelle's birthday today, too. All right, so we'll sing our last congregational song, and then, uh, Dad. Clothed in rainbows, a 
of living color Flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be To you the only wise King Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty Who was and is and is to come all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. I will adore you. Filled with wonder. Struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. morning. <laughs> this is the first time I've been up here with this thing. <laughs> it's like, I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know if I can. But anyways, I'd like to welcome everybody out. This is going to be interesting for me because it's like, it's going to, I know it's going to be like notes, microphone, because it's so big. <laughs> it's so big. I'd like to welcome everybody out this morning. Like I said, I'd like to welcome our visitors. Glad you are here. For those viewing online, we welcome you. We hope you enjoy the service and the message this morning. Um, I got uh, an interesting thought this morning uh, that I'm going to present, um, and I think it's interesting from the standpoint that it's the only thing that really just kept on beating off my mind this week. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with all the pleasantries because I want to get right into it. Uh, I think it's a powerful uh, message, and it has, I'm excited about it, and I have been excited about it because it has some of the most powerful passages of Scripture in the Bible, and I say some because there's so many, but I love what, what we're going to present this morning and the subject of it. We'll get into that in just a minute, but I'd like us to go to the Lord in a word of prayer first as we uh, begin this message. Gracious Holy Father, we come before you, Lord, with thankful hearts for this day that you made. We thank you so much for the blessing of life and health, and we thank you for your mercies and your grace. We thank you for your love that's unending, for your faithfulness, Lord, even when we are not. We thank you for your uh, willingness to guide and direct, to keep, um, to hold, to uh, show uh, us in many ways how you're always there um, doing the things that you do, Lord, to remind us of our need and to show us uh, how uh, valuable our relationship with you is. And so today we give you praise and thanks. We ask that you'll bless us as we go into this subject this morning. I pray for preaching grace, Lord. I pray that the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit will be welcome here, that the Spirit will move in the hearts and lives of all the hearers as this goes out. I pray that you'll move in me to bring this message the way that you want it brought. I want your Spirit, Lord, to have full course in it. I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to move and change lives, to have an impact, to open our minds, help us to understand, give me the ability I need to, to make it easy to understand with your help. And Lord, I pray that you receive the honor and the glory I ask that you'll forgive us and cleanse us of our iniquities. I pray that you'll help us to be mindful of the opportunities that you present, Lord, to, uh, to share your word with others. 
I ask that you be with our nation, that you'll bless us in this difficult time, that you will be done in the elections, that you'll give wisdom to our leaderships, uh, to our leadership people, Lord. I pray that you will bless those that are serving in all different capacities who are putting their lives in harm's way, that you'll keep them, bless them, strengthen them, and watch over them, I pray. Father, I pray that you'll bless this church and the work we're involved here in. I pray that you'll uh, bless this, Lord, to continue to strive for your cause, and we might be successful in doing so in a way that brings you honor and glory according to your will. And Lord, I ask these favors and blessings now in Jesus' holy name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, so this, this message this morning deals with a subject. I could have named it a lot of different things, and um, I, I didn't really focus so much on the title. I mean, I'm really not even going to. I might tell you at the end. Maybe you can just give it your own title. Um, it just depends on what the Holy Spirit does with it with you. But it stems around the answer to one question. And I know when I, I put this question out there that it's going to be a question that you could say it could go a lot of different ways. But the answer to the question is why. That's the question. And, and I know that why what? That's the next question, but I'm going to get into that. You're going to know what my why is today. You, know, you may have other whys, but today I'm going to focus on the why that the Lord has laid upon my heart. And I, I, it made when I was thinking of this question, why, that I had in my mind, it made me think of my wife because, you know, it must, be, it must have been weird for her when we first got together. The, some of the things I did with relationship to church and serving God and, and the things I did, she never, she never questioned it. Uh, even when it came to tithing, I remember going to her about tithing. I remember saying, you know, <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but I'm doing this. And, um, and it was one of those things where I think she just, uh, whatever you want to do, I trust you. I'm... But it had to seem weird because she came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ later in life. I don't know what that's like because I was raised in God's house. But um, some of the things we do and why we do them uh, may seem strange to people. I suppose it perplexes a lot of people. Why, why do we go to church so much? Why do we do? I mean, it's really not human nature, right? I mean, our nature could take us to a lot of different things, a lot of different ways, and we'd probably go there joyfully. It's really not our nature to do some of the things that God's people do or that we call them church people for the sake of just making it a little bit easier. Uh, church people do. Why do they do some of the things they do? Why, why do we come here two or three times a week? Why do we study the God's word? Why do we, why do we care enough to get into it and kind of understand it and, and even spend hours of our off time or, or time, you know, on the weekends when we're off work, doing more work or study in God's word so that we can teach it or preach it. And why, why does someone come down here early and, and practice songs so that they can, they can be prepared for the worship service when they sing them? And, and then um, why do people spend so much time coming and, and preparing for specials and, and stuff like that so they can present them and, and even risk sounding uh, weird or failing, you know, so that people might see them actually struggle. Because I've done that during a special before, for sure. <laughs> and some of you have witnessed that. Well, that's the focus of this message. That's my why. And I suppose that this message is my answer to that question. And it starts with this, this answer. This is the simple answer, but I'm going to give you the, the, the doctrinal answer from my perspective, the way I see that God's word revealing it to me. The answer, the simple answer is God revealed himself to humanity and it changed everything. Okay, that's the simple answer. Now, that, if, you, if, if you've been in the Bible, you, you probably already know what that means and, and what I'm getting at right there. But <clears throat> I, I want to get into this subject and I'm going to look at three different subjects. I'm going to look at self-revelation. I'm going to look at humiliation and I'm going to look at exaltation. These, these three things, to me, are, are going to answer the question as to why we do what we do. And for someone that hasn't been involved in church for very long, it may seem strange, but that's why I think this message is important. And for those that have been in church or still new or have been here a while and, and have been doing it a while, maybe you just need to be reminded of what we're doing here and why we're doing it. You know, to have that revival inside so that it may strengthen you. And I'm going to use passages of scripture that are very well known, but um, I can't help it because they're the best answer to the question. And I don't want to help it because they're great, powerful answers. Okay, so I'm going to start with the subject of self revelation and humiliation. And I'm going to read a passage of scripture, and it's from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. 
And it says this. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, it says, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to stop right there because I can't help but say this passage of scripture has been used a lot. And that one statement has probably had a ton of sermons built around it. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And, and, and I'm going to say something else because <laughs> I got to say it. Sometimes when you're reading the word, it's good if you just read it and allow just what it's saying to sink in. Just read it over and over again and just let what is actually being revealed have an impact. Try to understand every aspect of what is actually being said on the surface because that's going to pull you in to understanding what's at the deeper view of what's being said. So it says, let this mind be in you, which also, which was, uh, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So think about that. Okay, when you first read that, it's like, whew. so I'm one of those, I like, to, I like to go back in a little bit, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took on or took upon him the form of a servant. I mean, you already see what I'm going. I mean, the, the, it's so magnificently powerful what's being said here. And was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We'll get into all that. But I want to start with self-revelation. And to do that, I got to go back a little bit. So one of the names uh, for God in, in, in the Hebrew is the name Jehovah. And it was such a sacred name, they, they didn't necessarily say it all the time. There was times that they would say it, and offer it up. It was, it was something that was a very revered and powerful name to the Jews. Um, and so the name literally means this, and think about this. He that is who he is. It means the I am. It means the self-existing one. The word, now, I mean, that's incredibly powerful. What God is saying that with this name, what they're saying about God, what the, the representation of what's being said about who God is. But the word Hava, from which the name is formed, signifies to become. That is to become known. And, and what it's doing is this name is pointing to a continuous and increasing self-revelation. So I want to get the picture. A continuous and increasing self-revelation. So God is, is this, this Jehovah God is the self-existing one who is to become known or to reveal himself. Okay. Now I remember how we started out. God revealed himself to humanity and it changed everything. Okay. So the single greatest example of God's self-revelation is seen in the man, Christ Jesus. Not, not only man, but God as well. God incarnate. And if you don't know what incarnate means, it means God in the flesh or God made flesh. All man, all God. The union of the two. You know what the, 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 the powerful thing about this that's being said is this. To this point, no man like Jesus Christ ever existed. And since no man like him will ever exist again. And so God's word tells us about this, this individual and, and, and really expresses who he is. And I can't think of a better passage of scripture. One of my favorite passages from one of my favorite books in the Bible is from the book of Hebrews, chapter one, <laughs> verses one through three. And, oh, I love this so much. It has so much power. I want you to think about power when we read this, because power is being expressed, but it also self-revelation is being expressed. It says in Hebrews chapter one, verses one through three, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, and that word diverse manners means, that word diverse means um, many ways or more than one. 
So it says, God, who at sundry times and in many ways or many manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last times spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That, that is amazing to me because so much is being said there. There's many messages in it. But I want you just, for the sake of answering this question, who or why, I want you, and, and, and self-revelation, I want you to see some of the things that he's saying here. He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Not only did he reveal himself through the prophet in various ways and the things he did. And I reflect on someone like Jeremiah and all the things Jeremiah had to do as a prophet. And, 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 and then I think of Isaiah and I think of, you know, even some of the prophets, the minor prophets and some of the things they revealed that, uh, that were going to take place or were occurring or how God was working. All the ways he revealed himself to a people so that they might be his people and he might be their God. But it says in these last days, they've spoken unto us by his son. There's a revelation there. He's saying, I've spoken unto you by my son. And, and this one's special. This one is, is special. And I'll explain to you why. Because he's the one that's appointed heir of all things. He's also the one that made the worlds. So the one that made the world, who is the heir of all things, he's the one that I'm, I'm speaking to you through. Okay. But notice he says he is the brightness of the glory of God. So everything that represents the brightness of the glory of God is seen in the sun. And it says that he is the expressed image of his person. And I, and I've, I've, I've mentioned this to my class before, and I know some of you've heard it. I just like saying it, you know, but because it's true. When you, when you think of those old letters they used to send out and they put that little wax on there and they'd stamp it and the image of the king's seal would be in it. Okay, well, this ain't talking about that. It's talking about the stamp. So he is the stamp that everything that represents God in bodily form. And so, and, and, and we're going to get into the bodily form part and we're going to talk about that. So I don't want to jump ahead in my message here, but I get excited. <laughs> Anyways... He is the expressed image. He is the stamp that represents everything that God is in himself. What God wanted us to see and know about Jesus Christ, about himself in Jesus Christ. And he is the one, like I said, who formed the worlds. All the things that, I mean, we can see the self-revelation of God in the world itself, in the universe, in the cosmos, and all those things are held in check, all the laws of physics, all these things that these super bright and intelligent, smart science people are looking into and just saying, wow, that's blowing my mind. Jesus is upholding it by the power of his word, by the word of his power. It's, it's held in check by him. It's like, in other words, it is because of God that these things are held in check. And so, and it says, and he by himself purged our sins, and then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So now we're talking about self-revelation, uh, uh, um, self and we actually jumped a little bit to exaltation, but we got room for that. We'll get back to it. All right. One of the things that makes Jesus so marvelous is that he is said to be the literal word of God. In John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the definite, definite article occurs there in the Greek, expressing that fact, that the word was God. And it says in one fourteen, it says, And that word, the word, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now I'm going to start at the end. Can you work my way back on this one? Full of grace and truth. What I love about that statement is this. Full is full. And, and we, I, can, I can fill my coffee cup, and it's not quite full. Mine is. Actually, hers isn't. Mine is like at the rim where it has to stay on the, on the counter until I go, because I want to fill it up. Hers, she'll give herself a little room, but I don't waste coffee like that. 
I don't do it. Um, but this ain't talking about that. This saying that from a godly perspective, there was nothing lacking. There was nothing more that was needed, nothing more that needed to be added. It was full, and, and it was full of something. God's grace, or he was full of something. God's grace and God's truth. It was complete, and it was all there. Okay, so I love that picture because sometimes we have a tendency to look at things and we, we have a tendency to forget just what we're doing, what, what God has done and how important it is. Another thing that makes, I could have gone, you know what, let me just go back to that for a second. You know what else that says? John 1.1, 1, 1, and it goes on from there. I, I'd be lacking if I didn't add this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended or overcame it not. You know, again, testifying to who He is, who this one is, this one that is so special in God's eyes. Another one of the things that makes Jesus so marvelous is that while he existed in eternity, expressing his glory and deity, imagine it, he's in glory as God expressing his deity and majesty, and it was just, it was right, it was fitting that he should do so. He was willing to forego the right of self-glorified expression. He was, he was willing to forego the right of self-glorified expression and take on a humble form of a man of no reputation, one who would serve. Now, I didn't say, what I didn't say is he didn't forego his godliness, his deity. He, he forego, forego the right to express it as his glorified state. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more because we're going to go back to our original text in verses 6 and 7 of Philippians chapter 2. It says this, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. I did a study on this for another message I did years back. And what's being said here, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God is what we've kind of already touched on. He didn't clutch at the right to express himself as a glorified God so much so that he was not willing to take on this form to perform this thing that the father requested so that by it he might save humanity. <clears throat> he didn't say, you know, like some of, the, some of the people we see in society, they're like, no, no, look at me. Look at me. I am who I am, kind of in the same way, but on a much lower level, obviously. Or I look at me. I'm going to hold myself. I'm not going to go and, and, and put myself in that humble place. Because I've earned this. I have a right to it. That's not what he's saying here. Of course, he had every right to it. But the love of the Father was so great for you and I, for all of humanity, and his will to do the will of the Father was so great because of his love for the Father that he says, I'm willing to forego expressing myself as a glorified king and a God so that I might humil uh, humble myself, so that I might suffer the things that... The Father wants me to suffer so that by it, I might perform that which is necessary to save mankind. That is, well, when we got into this, we talked about humiliation. You know, what's, you know what God is doing in this humiliation? What he's still doing? Expressing himself. You see, what he's saying is, this is who I am. This is the love of God. This is, <clears throat> people have gods of the, their gods are, they, they're all powerful in their mind, in their heart, or whatever they believe. This God is, but he's saying, I'm willing to humble myself because of love. I'm willing to do this. And, and when you think about the humility that he suffered, God is saying, what you see now in Christ and his humility is the expressed image of, of godliness. It is actually... Contrary to what we see when we see humility, we see lowliness. Contrary, he's saying, no, this is righteousness. This is what righteousness looks like. You want to know what it looks like? Look at, look at my son, Jesus. You want to know what love looks like? 
Look at my son, Jesus. You know what makes me happy? Look at my son, Jesus, because he's showing you. He's revealing me to you in every way. Okay. The servitude of Jesus would cause him to endure many difficulties and sorrows, including even, including death, even the death of the cross. Even the death of the cross. One of the most unbelievably worst deaths you could ever die. The Romans were, were masters at, at painful death. They were masters at killing people. And they were not shy about it. And some of the things they would do, they would do were meant to intimidate and to scare other nations. There's, this is saying that he's, a, he's not only willing to suffer difficulties and sorrows for our sakes as a God made flesh in humble service for our sakes, and, and, and his humility is such that he would die even the death of the cross. Outside the gate, more humiliation. It's like spitting on him to top it off. But they say when they scourged him, that instead of, you know, like we would get scourged with the whip, like he, the, the, whatever they were using, the cat and nine tells things. And as they were cutting the flesh, we would have bled out. They say these men exhausted themselves on him, that they physically had, had worn themselves out. That the reason being is because his life, they could not take it. You know, I know this. I don't know to what extent Christ was scourged. It, the Bible just says he was scourged. I know this. You and I wouldn't have made it. And, and, and he did. And the reason he did, because when they started to cut the back with that whip and draw, draw it through, the, we would have bled out long before it was over. We, we would have cried out in pain, yet Christ stood there and took it. He could have, at that moment, he could have said, I'm done. Over. <laughs> and it would have been done. But he stood there and he took it. And that, not even that. They took him out and they nailed him to that cross. And they sunk that cross into the ground. And he gave his life for you and I in the most humiliating form, up on a tree, a cross, with an inscription above his head, which was a mockery. And people came and gawked at our crucified Lord. It says this in Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. He was esteemed not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. You know what it means when it says the chastisement of our peace was upon him? It means that everything he suffered was because of us so that we could gain peace with God. So the chastisement of our peace, the things that he had to endure to please the righteousness of God because of the penalty of sin was on him for our sakes. That's what it's talking about. So that, it can, that, that Isaiah could say, rightfully so, and, by, and with his stripes, we are healed. Here's the kicker. Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied this some 700 plus years BC before Christ ever came into this world. And this is exactly what Christ did. So God's, God's revealing himself in that. You go and look at some of the prophets and the thing they prophesied, and everything Christ did to fulfill every one of those prophecies is a revelation of God, a self-revelation of God, how God can move through society. He can move through history. He can have things occur in history that's going to testify of him and validate everything he's saying, and that's happened. All these scientists think they got it all figured out. They're looking in the wrong place. The humility and servitude of Jesus resulted in the God-required payment for the sin debt of mankind. And as, as Isaiah said, by his stripes, we are healed. Okay, so now I'd like to shift to the third and final point, which is the exaltation of Jesus. And I'm going to go back to Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 11. And we're going to talk a little bit about this and bring out a couple points. I mean, 
it's hard because there's so many <laughs> and I want to do them all, but uh, we'd be here for a long time. So it says in Philippians chapter two, verses nine through 11, it says, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. I love that. And I want to start with the very first word, wherefore, as a result of, it says, wherefore God hath highly exalted him. I'm going to do a little word study stuff with you right now, because I think it just serves to bring it out to light. And I'm not going to go all the way in, Brother Roman. I'm not going all the way in. I'm just going to get the surface. So here, here we go. <clears throat> wherefore is a word that's describing because of. Um, because of that which has just been explained. And, and importantly, the voluntary act of what just happened. <clears throat> Wherefore, of the, the voluntary act of, of the son being able to lay down the right to express himself as deity and humble himself and do this, uh, uh, do uh, and suffer, bleed and die for our sakes, to still appease the judgment of God upon sin, Wherefore, as, as him volunteering to do that, voluntarily volunteering to do that, wherefore, he says, God also hath highly exalted him. And this word also is, is interesting as well, because it's showing you that, that what happened here was twofold. God wanted his son to do this, and the son was obedient, but God also wanted to glorify him because it was right and just and fitting for that which he had done. You see, in response to the obedience of the son to willfully humiliate himself for our sakes, this father's saying, it's also rightly my will that you should be glorified in this regard because it's fitting. And see, I want to point out this point. This is a point I want, I want us all to understand. This helps us along the way, and that is... God is just. So that which we do as believers, as sons and children of God, if you're a believer, and, and as those that are striving for his cause, nothing goes unnoticed by God. It's what God will justly reward, and it will be fitting and right and true. And so that's what he's revealing to us in this as well. He also says, highly exalted. The words highly exalted are translated from a Greek word, which means this. So the original text, for those that don't know, was Kone Greek, and um, he's saying they take this and they translate it into the English, and we get the words highly exalted, but that original word means this, to exalt to the highest rank and power, to raise to supreme majesty, and it refers to the, it refers to the super eminence or imminent exaltation. And that what, what I'm saying by that, I'm using these words that might be hard, but I'm going to explain them because I want us to understand imminent is before everything or above everything. So he's being raised now to this position or, and, and I'm, <laughs> the question might be, well, it wasn't he already there? Well, there's something I'm going to tie to that and we're going to see what's happening here because we're, we're not just talking about the glorified uh, Jesus, the son of God before, when it, before, he came to this earth. We're talking about what happened after he came to this earth as the man God. So let me make this point for you here. He's now being elevated to super eminent exaltation, which is to say above all. So I had this passage of scripture, another one of my favorites from the book of Ephesians chapter one, verses 19 to 23. And it really describes what this entails. And it says this, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? To uh, let me go back. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which was wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. 
So there's a lot that's said there. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe according to the working of his power? So what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe? Okay, the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe is, is that which he accomplished in us through himself. Those things, the exceeding greatness of his power to us would believe is that which we receive as a result of that. Look, we are, when you think about this, I'm, before, before Christ, I was an enemy of God, alienated from the commonwealth. I was one that was, was uh, an enemy of God. And while I was yet an enemy of God, the Bible says Christ died for me. And as a result of that, he made me a child of God. He made me a joint heir with Jesus. And, and I don't know what I will be, but I know I'll be like him because I'll see him as he is. That's, that's what he, the, the exceeding greatness of his power towards me is referencing. And, and it says, and it's wrought in Christ when he was raised from the dead and set at his own right hand in heavenly places. So by that resurrection, that resurrection power, Christ, they didn't take his life. He had, it says that he had, he had the commandment from the Father that he could lay his life down. He could take it up again. Here's the truth. The truth of the matter is because Christ was perfect, death had no authority over him. He, it had no control. It had no power over Christ. He had power to lay it down. He had power to take it up again. And that same power works in us as believers to those who believe. All right. But notice what it says far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. So. We are really the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He, going back to filleth all in all, it starts at salvation. And certainly salvation is a filling of us, of the Holy, Holy Ghost and, 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 and the, the, the abolishing of sin in our eternal soul. Okay? But it's also the sanctification of God in our lives through the process of the regeneration of the mind through the word. Not only the living word, but the written word. Not only the living word, the written word, but the Holy Spirit that indwells us. Filling us up with godliness. Directing our lives. Moving in us in such a way that we, we see him working and moving and, and changing us to, to make us different than we were when we were his enemies. When we were alienated from God and lost and undone without Jesus Christ. Paul told the Philippians that God had given him a name which is above every name. The word given here, it's the same word that is, is the word that's used when it talks about the grace of God and giving a lost person salvation. So it's the same kind, it's the same word. When a person comes to Jesus Christ and says, I'm a sinner and, and I, need to, I need to be saved, please forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and life and save me. God's grace moving in such a way to perfect that in them is the same word that's being used here to describe given him a name which is above every name. It means it's showing the grace of God justly so because of that which Jesus has done. It's putting, a, it's putting a bar on the gift. You see, there was nothing that the father, I, I would say, could possibly hold back and didn't because everything was completely, exactly, in every form, fully what God required. And so, so pleased was the father that when it came time to exalt the, the son for what he had done, it was, it was graciously given. And so I want to, I want to kind of um, shift a little bit. This is the part of the sermon right now. I'm just going to warn you because we're a little bit later. It's the hardest part and I want, I, I, I prayed a lot about trying to get this to a point where it would be easy to understand because it's contextually kind of hard to get here. But I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible and, and not mess it up. So let's see how it goes. That which was graciously, graciously bestowed, on, uh, bestowed on Jesus was not a name. It was the name. Okay. 
The definite article in the Greek text refers to a particular name. So when it's, it's talking about, when you go to the, look at this verse and you see that, that the name was given him, it's in, it's, the definite article occurs in the Greek, which, which says it is a specific name. So it's not a name, it's the name. Okay? And, and, and the emphasis I want to put on this is that he's the only one that's got this name. It's the name. Okay? Granted, the granting of this title, the name, upon which the Lord Jesus, as the Son of Man, his righteousness and holiness, but also his humanity, is, is a spectacular concept, all right? Because I, I, I don't even know how to put this into words sometimes. When Jesus Christ was glorified, when he, he, was, when he rose from the dead and he was glorified, that form that he had was a union, of his resurrected humanity and his godliness. Humanity had never been in that form before. He was the first fruits. You see what's being done here? He paved the way for us to experience that ourselves as human beings. He paved the way. And so what's being said here is this union, God graciously, happily, and justly bestows on him the name. And remember what we already said about his exaltation, all right? A man, the man Christ Jesus, who was the very God and voluntarily laid down his expression of the glory of godliness during the time he was a man, and now is being placed upon his shoulders all the majesty, dignity, and glory of deity itself. And this is the part I'm going to try really hard. I tried so many ways to word this. <laughs> and I just, I'm probably just going to have to read it to you three times. So it just sinks in. Okay. It is the God man who stooped to the depths, the depths of humility, who is raised now as God, who was raised not as God now, but or, let me go back. It is the God man who stooped to the depths of humility, who was raised not as God now, although he was all that, but as a man also to the infinite height of exaltation possessed only by deity. And that's what I'm saying. See, God, Jesus Christ did something that had never been done before, and God rewarded it because it was justly and rightly. And there, was, there, was, there could be no reason for anything less. All right? He met every expectation, every bar. And so he was exalted above all. But, but what he did is he, he was exalted not only in his pure godliness, but in his sinless humanity as well. And so as a result... He was the first fruits of the resurrection, and by him and by his resurrection power, we can be resurrected as well. And that's the promise we have in Jesus Christ. The name declares the glory of all godliness, not seen this time like it did in infinite splendor before his fleshly incarnate, but that glory shining in perfect individualism to that uh, to and with the glorified humanity raised now itself in, in a place of equal dignity with deity and godliness. That's our savior. Okay. I want to close with a couple things here. All right. It says that as a result of him being given the name and him being elevated to a preeminent state above all, it says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And it's not just the name Jesus that they're bowing to. It's the name that he, he possesses, his title. So it's the name that belongs to Jesus. Every knee will bow. And when they bow and they confess, they will look upon him, and they won't be like, uh, I don't know, I'm, I, might, I might argue that, God. Every knee shall bow and every tongue will recognize without any doubt who Jesus Christ is. 
Lord, uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The scene, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add this passage of scripture because it's a powerful one. The scene of this very Jesus coming again in glory is quite breathtaking and occurs in Revelations 19, 11 through 16. And it says this, and I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, which with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he, and, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of wrath and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. And it's in capital letters in the text, and it says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's, that's the exalted Jesus Christ. All, all creation will render homage, whether animate or inanimate, whether in heaven or earth or under the earth. And finally, verses uh, 10 and 11 of our text said this, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. The final thing I want to mention is, is the name Lord. It said in verse 11, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That name Lord is the translation of a word found in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So what that means is the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. When they translated it to the Greek and they came to the name Jehovah, they used this Greek word that is represented here as Lord in this text as the word to translate Jehovah in the Greek. Okay. So I think that's interesting because that word Kyrios, if I pronounced it correctly, is what, the, what they used to translate the name Jehovah in the Greek when they were translating the Old Testament into Greek, saying that this Lord is the self-existing one who reveals himself, who will be revealed. And he will be revealed, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess. So I close this message with where we started. Why? Why do we do this? Because in our sinful, spiritual, dead state, God chose to reveal himself. He humbled himself and took on the form of a man, made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He became a servant of man, or a servant to his creation for their sakes. He suffered, bled, and died so that by his stripes we could be healed. He is now exalted above all others and declared infinitely worthy of all praise by God the Father. Because he saved us, and as saved, baptized believers, we are a part of his church, which he is the head of, and which he suffered, bled, and died for. And it is by his blood-bought institution, which he started in his humility, that he desires to receive praise, honor, and glory. Ephesians 3.21 says, Unto him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. That's why. That's my answer to the question. And I think God's word makes it quite clear that he's worthy of everything we can do. Let's go, Lord, in a word of prayer. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. My soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul my sin oh 
the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be signed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Well, it is well with my soul.